Hello, BookTube. I'm not really sure what the upper limit is for how much you can hear about books on one channel in one day, but I've got your more books that I want to show you. <laughs> That's all there is to it. I've got a bunch more books, another pile of books that I want to show you. These are neither new nor old, uh, for the most part. I think the first one is new, but otherwise they're neither new nor old. They're new, they happen to come to me, and they're on my mind. So I thought I'd show them to you. A lot of you uh, are new to this channel. Probably 2,000 of you are here who weren't here in 2019. Uh, and even the people who aren't new to the channel, who've been around for a while, don't memorize every video. So I thought we'd just go through these and just uh, talk about them a little. That's all. I don't have any more organizing principle than that. <laughs> it's just, I want to see how many books I need to mention in one day to break BookTube. <laughs> so first one we're going to do is the one, is one from 2021. I think it came out this summer. I don't think it's brand new. Uh, but I don't think we've ever seen it either. I'm, I'm pretty sure we've never seen any of these books on this channel. Uh, this is by Joe Emmersberger and Justin Poder, and it's called Extraordinary Threat, The U.S. Empire, The Media, and 20 Years of Coup Attempts in Venezuela, with a U.S. aircraft carrier on the cover there. Is that a bird in the foreground? No, it's a jet coming off. Beep, beep, cut it out. Uh, so what do we got here? This is uh, Venezuela. So you just know that President Obama is going to take it on the chin uh, in this pub sheet. What have we got here? In 2015, President Obama declared the situation in Venezuela an unusual and extraordinary threat to U.S. national security and foreign policy, uh, proclaimed a national emergency, and slammed sanctions against Venezuela. As the U.S. government repeats this claim annually, tens of thousands of Venezuelans continue to die due to ever-tightening U.S. sanctions, which daily deny people access to food, medicine, and fuel. Uh, it's one, of, one of the problems with the U.S. sanctions, one of the many problems, is that they aren't designed to punish the guilty. They're designed to punish the innocent until the innocent take to the streets and topple the guilty. Uh, which is really rough. That, that is a really cruel way to, do, to conduct foreign policy. I'm not saying there's any that I can think of any uh, equally effective alternative, but that's rough. Uh, on top of this, Venezuela has, since 2002, been subjected to six coup attempts by U.S.-backed forces. In this solidly sourced book, the authors demonstrate the opposite. It is, in fact, U.S. policy that constitutes an extraordinary threat to Venezuelans. So that's going to be that's going to be a sobering reading to do. I missed this completely. I think it came out this summer. Uh, but I missed it completely. And if you are interested in U.S. foreign policy, if you're interested in U.S. and Venezuela, obviously you have to have this book. Uh, so I thought I would show it to you. That's why. I'm not saying there's much of what the BroTube channels on YouTube call value in this video. I just have more books, and I like talking with you about books. That's all. Uh, this next one is a finished copy of something that came out a, a few years ago. But I don't think we ever saw it on this channel or talked about it, so I thought I'd show it to you. That's all don't have any justification other than that. This is by Lulu Miller, and it's called Why Fish Don't Exist, A Story of Lost Love and the Hidden Order of Life. Why Fish Don't Exist. <laughs> David Starr Jordan was a taxonomist, a man possessed with bringing order to the natural world. In time, he would be credited with discovering nearly a fifth of the fish known to humans in his day. But the more of the hidden blueprint of life he uncovered, the harder the universe seemed to try to thwart him. His specimen collections were demolished by lightning, by fire, and eventually by the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, <laughs> which sent more than a thousand of his discoveries housed in fragile glass jars plummeting to the floor. In an instant, his life's work was shattered. Many might have given up, given in to despair, but Jordan, he surveyed the wreckage at his feet, found the first fish he recognized, and confidently began to rebuild his collection. And this time, he introduced one clever innovation that he believed would at least protect his work against the chaos of the world. When NPR reporter Lulu Miller first heard this anecdote in passing, she took Jordan for a fool, a cautionary tale of hubris or denial. But as her own life slowly unraveled, she began to wonder about him. Perhaps instead he was a model for how to go on when all seemed lost. What she would unearth about his life would transform her understanding of history, morality, and the world beneath her feet. Uh... This book has blurbs on it already uh, uh, on the back from Leslie Jameson, Jonathan Goldstein, uh, Susan Orlean, Mary Roach. Uh, I think it came out in 2019. Uh, is that right? 2020. This came out in 2020. It's probably out in paperback by now. Sounds fascinating. I thought you'd like to see it. I'm not sure we've ever talked about it on this channel. I sympathize. 
uh, with that poor ichthyologist, very much so. I had that exact kind of moment, and it is hard. It is hard to bear up. It's when you learn what you're made of, when you have a moment like that. I just pray it never happens to you. It's a bad moment to go through. I was I took my first vacation out of the state of Massachusetts in 20 years, years and years ago. I decided I will elaborately arrange care for my beagles, and I will take a vacation to Washington, my old stomping ground. It would be great to see it again. I will take a vacation. I will take the train down to Washington. I will enjoy myself for a weekend, and then I will come back. I remember telling myself, it's not like the world is going to end. I got to Washington. A friend of mine and I went to see a movie. The movie was Star Trek II. Or no, Star, no Spider-Man II, where Spider-Man fights Dr. Octopus. Uh, where Dr. Octopus uses one of his arms to rip out the controls of a hurtling subway car and then says to Peter, says to Spider-Man, you've got a train to catch. <laughs> I love that movie. Uh, no sooner got back from watching that movie uh, than I encountered a million phone messages that my house had burned down and that uh, by a miracle, the people there had managed to get my beagles out to the sidewalk. And that every, the Beagles were, my boys were okay, and everyone else in the house was okay. But that every, it looked like a total loss when, from the messages that I heard in Washington. The next morning, I got back on the train. After a night in, I'm going to say it's a sleepless night. A lot of my nights are sleepless nights. I was laying there in the guest room. My, you can just imagine, my mind was just reeling at all that had happened, at all that I had lost, and what I had to face, finding a new place to live out of nowhere. This was the second house fire that I'd been through, and it was worse than the first. Uh, periodically, throughout that sleepless night, the guest room door would, would swing open a little, and one of the black cats that lived in the house would saunter into the room. And at one point, I said to the brute, I've lost everything in a house fire. And the look on the cat's face was, Pfft, and it turned around and walked out. Uh, I got back on the train the next morning, went back to Boston, and surveyed the wreckage but before i did in washington that night i suddenly realized that the book i had been working on a big manuscript that i had been working on must be lost it must be gone and maybe a lot of other manuscripts as well and i remember saying to the friend that i was with i experienced that moment and said all that work is gone and it's not backed up anywhere it's typed and then i thought i'll write it again and i'll write it better and that was a horrible, bleak moment, I'll tell you. Uh, so John, I, I just thought I'd show you why fish don't exist, just in case you're interested. And this next one uh, is Trump and the Media, uh, edited by Pablo Borsowski and Zizi Papacherisky. Probably, probably did both of those wrong. This is all about uh, what Trump did to the media, which means it is not a closed subject. Uh, Donald Trump's election as the 45th president of the United States came as a surprise to many analysts, journalists, and voters. Not to me, not if you've been watching this channel. Uh, the New York Times, the upshot, gave Hillary and Clinton an 85% chance of winning the White House even as the returns began to come in. What happened? And what role did the news and social media play in the election? In Trump and the media, journalists and technology experts grapple with these questions in a series of short, thought-provoking essays. What actually happened? Uh, so there you go. Trump and the media. If you if you read Trump books and you missed that one, they, now you know that it exists. Uh, another book I want to show you, I think this is from uh, last year. Uh, this is from, uh, this is by Amitava Kumar, and it is called Every Day I Write the Book, Notes on Style. And you writers will know this right away, right? That is, oh my God, that is the bane of every writer's existence. Uh the author's Every Day I Write the Book is, is for academic writers what Annie Dillard's The Writing Life or Stephen King's On Writing was for creative writers. Alongside Kumar's interviews with an array of scholars whose distinct writing offers inspiring examples for students and academics alike, the book's pages are full of practical advice about everything from how to write criticism uh, to making use of a kitchen timer. Communication, engagement, honesty, these are the aims and sources of good writing. Storytelling, attention to organization, solid work habits, these are its tools. The author's own voice is present in his essays about the writing process and his perceptive and witty observations of the academic world. 
So there you go. If you didn't know this existed, and maybe you have a lot of academic writing that you have to do, now you do know that this exists. Although, keep in mind, I know you're going to want to know what Steve thinks in this, as in all things, as well you should. And Steve is going to say there shouldn't be any effective difference between creative writing and academic writing. The fact that there is a separate label for academic writing is, is an open door to the abuses of academic writing, which are really bad. Academic writing is legendary for how bad it is, specifically because somewhere along the line, somehow we normalized the idea that academic writing was different from any other kind of writing <laughs> and didn't have to be readable or entertaining or interesting or pithy. It has to be all of those things. All writing has to be all of those things. If your writing is not enjoyable to read, it is a failure. <laughs> okay? No matter what it is, no matter what it's trying to do, if it's prose, if you're just writing formula for some sort of government think tank, fine. But if you're writing prose and your prose is not enjoyable to read, you are writing bad prose. And you might say, well, it's my job. Got to do it. Sorry. You know, and besides, who cares? If that is your answer, I want to remind you that in about 10 minutes, you're going to be dead. <laughs> you are not going to want, in the, in the one second before that happens, you are going to see clearly how much time you wasted writing crappy prose. And you're not going to be happy about it. I'm trying to help you. Help me help you. I'm trying to help you. Never write bad prose. Just don't do it. Okay? Uh, so every day I write the book. For you academic uh, writers, technical writers, you might want it. And then this last one, and then we'll be done with just a totally random book video. I can make ten of these. Do I dare? Would ten break book two? <laughs> just ten books where I, ten videos where I just talk about books. <laughs> you may have missed these. It may be interesting for them to revive they came across my path, so I'm making a video. So sue me. <laughs> so this last one will be familiar to a lot of you. Uh, it was praised, I'm happy to say, by a lot of my critical brethren. Uh, and it was praised by me. Not at first. My first dip into it was I was distinctly unimpressed. And then one of, uh, one of the critics of contemporary fiction that I most revere, and also uh, my best human friend, praised it and told me, don't write it off. Try it. Again, you really like it. And I did. This is Actress by Anne Enright. A terrific contemporary novel. None of the autofiction, none of the postmodern, none of the, the Twitterati, stupid, navel-gazing gimmicks that I decry so much in modern fiction. None of them. Uh, so let me, let me read you a little about this here. Uh, let's see. Let's see what we've got here. Uh, uh, let's see here. This is a brilliant and moving tale about celebrity, sexual power, and a daughter's search to understand her mother's hidden truths. Uh, every moment of Catherine, of Catherine O'Dell's life is a performance, with young Nora standing in the wings, bearing witness to and often sharing in the emotional wounds dealt to her mother by men in positions of power. Over time, Nora's role graduate, gradually changes to Catherine's protector, caregiver, and finally legacy keeper. Left at her mother's death with old photographs, playbills, newspaper clippings, and her mother's black emerald ring, Nora revisits her mother's life of fiercely kept secrets. When Catherine O'Dell ate toast and marmalade, she was, quote, like anyone else eating toast and marmalade. But what she was like as a mother and actress is far more complex and difficult for Nora to express. An extraordinarily gifted and beautiful woman, Catherine was also mentally unstable. When Nora was 28 years old, Catherine took an army-issued pistol and shot the famous Irish producer Boyd O'Neill in the foot. Her crime spawned, quote, a hundred Dublin punchlines. But for Nora, the incident was heartbreaking, as it marked the beginning of the end of her mother's life. Catherine was committed to a mental hospital, and after four years, she was released, rattling with pills, a much-reduced, soon-to-be-terminally-ill woman who was invisible on the street to those who passed her by. A complete reversal of what she once was. Uh, and this is amazing. This, this novel is amazing. It is every bit as good as all of its critics have said that it is. And it's recent. It's from last year. So if you have heard about this thing and you were wondering what I thought, I don't remember if we saw this on, the, on my channel. But if, you, if you've heard about it and you were wondering what I thought about it, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. A piece of contemporary fiction that I loved. It does happen. Actress by Anne Enright. So there you go. A completely motivationless book video. <laughs> we'll do another pyramid. We have Actress by Anne Enright. We have Every Day I Write the Book about academic writing. 
Very important. To make academic writing better is very important. It is an endeavor that would uplift us all. Then we have Trump and the media, a collection of stories about why the media gave Donald Trump such an unprecedented amounts of free advertising, what responsibility they have for catapulting him into power, and how he changed the media once he got there. A uh, whole bunch of essays, of course, in a collection. Some essays look better than others, but, you know, you know that when you go in. Uh, then we have uh, Why Fish Don't Exist, an odd personal meditation that is also a historical uh, examination of one uh, early 20th century naturalist you will not have heard about, even if you favor natural history writing as I do, you will not have heard of this man. Uh, and finally, Extraordinary Threat, in which two hardworking journalists put forward the uh, rather obvious case that the United States is a threat to Venezuela, not Venezuela to the United States, and probably go over in great detail a lot of uh, U.S. crimes when it comes to Venezuela. So there you go. There's another pile of books. Justification? Zero. <laughs> I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.